Thank you very much, Martin, for the introduction. Indeed, my name is Martin Davey. I'm uh, Associate Professor of Engineering Science and uh, a member of Exeter College. My presentation today is um, entitled In It for the Long Haul. And what I hope to do is describe a future for the internal combustion engine, and maybe something that um, you hadn't particularly considered given recent developments in um, electrification. I had not really given any thoughts to where we are presenting. Um, and maybe, um, had I done so, I would have changed my title maybe, maybe to something like uh, internal combustion engine more than just a dodo. <laughs> so I am a member of the Thermal Proposal Systems Group. This was founded in the early 1990s by Professor Richard Stone, who I don't think is here today, um, which is good because I can speak positively about him. He's um, perhaps the UK's most eminent researcher in this area and has been for, for, for many years and it's a great pleasure to be in the group that he founded and he founded it on the ethos really of fundamental scientific research into engines. We don't just run engines and see what happens, we run engines of a particular type and try and find out why certain things happen. So what we see here are the three pillars really of our activities we run dedicated research engines, small single cylinder engines, often with optical access into the cylinder, so a glass or a quartz cylinder, so that we can measure in cylinder phenomena such as airflow motion, such as spray atomization, mixing processes, um, flame propagation, and indeed using laser measurement techniques, we can measure emissions formation in cylinder, and we can attempt to devise means and mechanisms by which to reduce that emissions, or those emissions. In the center you see um, some of the work we do on rigs, again demonstrating our uh, interest in fundamental science, often these are done on desktop experiments, but um, clearly that would be quite a big desktop, it's an 11 meter shock, shock tube based at uh, Arisley Thermal Fluids Institute. Um, and that's designed specifically to give us a small volume of heated and compressed gas to mimic the conditions inside an engine cylinder without the, the turbulence associated with engine operation so that we can perform fundamental studies on spray properties and fuel properties, things such as um, the auto ignition. And increasingly over the years, our work has moved towards the development of numerical models. So this is a simulation um, here of airflow into a typical four valve modern diesel engine and much of our work is dedicated into finding out the necessary fundamental knowledge we need to build better models to include more physics and to make the models more predictive and over the last seven years we've been working very closely with Jaguar Land Rover first of all um, as the host of their um, center of excellence for combustion uh, in diesel engines and more recently, as the host of a EPSRC Prosperity Partnership, um, a collaboration between ourselves, the University of Bath, Jaguar Land Rover, and Siemens Digital Industries, which is the focus on uh, developing numerical tools uh, with which to develop engines. Now, as I said, if you've been following things that have been going on in the press, uh, things that have been going on in the House of Commons and the like, you'll see um, stories such as, well, we're going to have a ban on IC engines um, from 2030 in the UK. The EU legislators have just announced uh, plans for a 2035 ban. That, you might have seen yesterday in the papers, is going to be resisted by Germany and other things. And that reminds us that any solution that we have to climate change problems needs to fit um, both our available technologies or future, future available technologies, uh, politics and economics. We need to be at that sweet spot where the technology is good enough, that it's affordable enough and that it is politically acceptable. In terms of climate change, uh, we all know there is some urgency associated with that, so we might add a fourth constraint in there um, and put time. It needs to be a solution that we can implement in a timely manner. So, what we need is time, money, and a plan. 
I suspect I could argue against any one of those three, perhaps all three of them, particularly around um, issues such as when we decarbonize the grid by using renewable energy sources, how do we deal with that intermittency? What is our plan in this country for energy storage? I might come back to that a little bit later on. We should also bear in mind that new technology alone may not give us everything that we want. Electrification is not the same as zero emissions. Zero emission at tailpipe, yes, there is no tailpipe. But we still have to generate the electricity, we still have to build the cars, and we still have interesting problems. So it is, I like this picture, it's a picture of traffic going into, I believe, Toronto, and there's a fabulous cycle lane at the side of a traffic queue. And depending on which side of the Atlantic you are, it's a really nice pavement or sidewalk. There are two people on the pavement or sidewalk. If I electrify the whole fleet and I do nothing else, then the situation looks like that. <laughs> and so I'm still stuck with my traffic jam. I have likely reduced my CO2 emissions substantially with a good grid. I will have hopefully improved my air quality, but not in every aspect. So um, in terms of mass emitted, the particulate emissions from tires and brakes are something like a thousand times the amount of particulates that are emitted from the tailpipe of a modern vehicle with a particulate trap. If I really want the maximum benefit from this change of technology and I want to go further, then what I need to do is change our behavior as well. So I need to get people out of those cars, onto the cycle path, onto the pavement walking, or into perhaps multi-occupancy vehicles, buses, coaches, public transit, etc. So what I like about this is that the options, societal options, are, are obvious. I can make choices to reduce my emissions that don't involve the technology. I can go above and beyond the technology. But that's not the case for a lot of our modern world. We have developed and engineered, if you like, a society dependent on global trade and industry. And it affects every single aspect of our life. And perhaps we could run a, a small experiment to demonstrate that. If you're comfortably able to do so, please would you stand up? And then what sort of things might we really need? Um, if you are confident that your underwear is made in the UK from UK-based materials, please remain standing. Otherwise, sit down. <laughs> if, you're, if you're not sure, you'll probably need to be sitting. Otherwise, there may be an inspection. <laughs> but I could go through and I could make the point about various different things, whether it's shoes, smartphones, travel. We are wedded to a global industry. We are a consumer nation as are many other developed nations in the world. There is a demand satisfying those three points. There's a demand, and one of the bits of demand that we have for technology is economy. We need to have things at an appropriate cost. And somehow, the world has worked out in such a way that we think it's appropriate to have raw materials in one country and a demand in another country and maybe build a product in a third country. And there's an environmental cost associated with all of that. If we look at the level of marine traffic we have, and I love this site, marinetraffic.com. You can go onto there. You can get a picture of where all the shipping is at any point in the world. And you can zoom in and get huge amounts of details, ship names, locations where they're going to. The green markers are cargo ships. And the red markers are oil tankers. And if we look at the breakdown of the global fleet, then we see that 90% of the dead weight tonnage of the marine fleet is in these cargo classes, bulk carriers, oil tankers, containers, um, chemical tankers, and, and general cargo ships. And of that group of vessels, the container fleet is probably the one that consumes the most fuel and thereby emits the most CO2. So a quarter of all the shipping fuel consumption 
is related to the movement of goods in container ships. Now, these things are huge. They require an enormous amount of power. So the picture there um, is the new Ever Ace from the Evergreen line, which you probably recognize from having one of their ships stuck across the Suez Canal for a few days. Um, that is about 400 meters long. The average fleet size is around 200 meters, just over 200 meters. The power required to move these things, and they're required to move quickly, so an average speed of 23 knots, is around 28 megawatt engines. Okay. These engines are typically two to three stories high and may be as long as 25 meters. The carrying capacity is enormous, and we'll come back to that because it's important when we look at options. So the small fleet sizes are around 600 TEUs. Does anyone know what a TEU is? 20 foot equivalent unit. Exactly, a 20 foot equivalent unit. So a measurement of container size, essentially. The big ships, like this one, the newer ones, they will take more than that 1450 that I've got there. Um, I think the, the top number now is around 21,000 TEUs being carried on a single ship on a single voyage. In terms of where we are in terms of CO2 emissions, if international shipping were a country, we'd sit around sixth. And alarmingly, the demand for international shipping is growing at approximately 3% um, per year. So by 2050, we're two, two and a half times, 2.4 times, I think, more shipping than we have at the moment. And of course, if we don't do anything about how we drive the ships, then our CO2 emissions increase accordingly. Now, this is a, a recognized problem. The International Maritime Organization took steps a little while back. Um, they announced some targets, 40% reduction of CO2 by 2030. By 2050, a 70% reduction in CO2. And it's great to have targets. How do you meet the targets is a different question. These ships are significant investment, 120, 130 million pounds for a container ship, big one, um, sorry, dollars. Um, they're often built around the engine. We can't just slip a different engine in or out. What other technologies do we have available to us? Can we electrify the fleet? Um, what we see is the emissions are from the, from the long journeys, from the, from the deep water fleet, by and large. There are efforts to electrify close to shore and inland container shipping. The Yara Birkeland, launched in Norway last year, I believe, um, it's a fully autonomous electric container vessel. It has a range, or is designed for a, for a, a journey of 12 miles and carries 120 TEUs. Um, inland, in China, on the Yangtze River, there's plans to have um, a ship that will take 600 TEUs. So we're getting up there in size now. Its range is somewhere in the region of 85 miles. And so there are plans for battery swapping. Batteries in large containers, and you swap them in and out at different ports as you stop. But in terms of practical ways of dealing with this international trade across oceans, it's not an option. Is a fuel cell an option? Perhaps, although it would be very hard. It's a hard, robust uh, uh, environment. It would be very hard to persuade people to invest in these ships with an unknown technology. So the IMO said, under every scenario that we can look at for 2050, we need to be using low carbon alternative fuels in engines. The future for the internal combustion engine. What fuels do they propose? Well, all the, all the usual suspects. You'd have seen all sorts of people talking about decarbonisation of all different sectors of transport, and these fuels always, always show up. Green methanol, green methane. The particular one of interest to the marine industry at the moment seems to be um, green ammonia. And by say green, these are e-fuels essentially produced using renewable electricity perhaps at a time um, when we can't be using that electricity directly when we're generating it maybe that's a good use for storage of renewably generated electricity 
Regardless of the fuel we choose, uh, we have some common problems. Cost. We're all about cost here, aren't we? We're producing goods that you want to buy at a price that you are prepared to pay. And the cost of the fuel and the transportation is a major factor in that. These current engines use residual fuels. The gunk that's left over after you take off the nice high distillates of gasoline and the medium distillates of diesel and marine diesel. The gunge that's left at the bottom of the pot is cheap and is used to power these vehicles. We need to have new fuels that will compete on a cost basis. We need to have fuels that will be better on an environmental basis. And we need to have large scale availability. Ammonia is attractive to them, they say, because um, we already have a large ammonia industry who know how to move things around. But um, conventional ammonia production uses a lot of energy and produces a lot of CO2. If we're to power our fleet with green ammonia, not only do we need to make that green ammonia, we need to make it in a much larger quantity. So the estimates from Lloyd's Registry are that we need to um, double the ammonia production to have a 30% fleet penetration of ammonia vessels by 2050. The other challenge, and this is where we get back to engines and my research, we talked about the fact that we're working on models. A lot of our research is fundamental science to give us the means to build new and better numerical models. We have aspects of these new fuels, whether it be ammonia, which suffers from poor ignitability, some really slow burning velocity, um, has some nitrogen attached to it naturally, so we have NOx emissions. Um, it's toxic and corrosive. I could look at hydrogen that has a really fast flame speed. Um, our biggest problem there is not poor ignitability, but stopping it going bang before we want it to. How do I deal with these things? What are, I've, we've got lots, these are problems we've addressed conventionally with diesel and, and uh, heavy fuel oil and gasoline. We have ideas and ways to do it. How do we prove it out? Well, one way I don't prove it out is experimentally. I could go to our head of department and say, Ron, please go to have a new test cell. My engine is three stories high. This is to scale for the little person on the top. Um, it's 30 meters long. Can I have the entire Keeble triangle? Because I actually need all the ancillary stuff to run this engine. Can I can have Bedbrook. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so the reality is we develop these things in, in, in simulation. And the problem in moving to new fuels is that we really don't have very good predictive models for lots of key processes, whether it be atomization, uh, whether it's gas mixing, whether differential diffusion of hydrogen might be significant, for example. Heat transfer models, often they're correlations based on existing data from gasoline and diesel. Um, and the combustion process itself, when the fuel auto ignites. We have a lot of experience with gasoline and diesel. And we fudge these models. We tune them to certain parameters, matched to experimental data, which is fairly easy to get if your engine's only this big. Less easy in that particular case. And having done that, we say, well, it's predictive within a small range away from where we've tuned it. But now we're looking at completely new fuels. So we need significant investment. And really, that's my conclusion. It's a non-technical presentation because I believe that the way the world is moving, we tend to forget about things other than personal transportation. And transportation, as we'll hear about aviation, transportation is much more than that. If we do nothing, it's predicted with the decarbonation of other sectors, the freight industry, the shipping and aviation, will form 40% of global total CO2 emissions by 2050. We can't electrify, we know that. We can possibly use these, well, we can definitely use low and zero carbon fuels. There's still questions as to whether we can supply enough and what fuel that would be. But what we urgently need to do is to continue the work that we're doing at the moment, just with a different application, uh, and develop improved and new numerical models. And to do that, rather than ramping down our IC engine research, which when we look at the uh, passenger vehicle market might seem the obvious thing to do, this is exactly the time we need to be ramping up our research in both facilities and people. And with that, 
I will leave you and um, be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much.